Well, good morning and welcome to CCF. We're so excited that you've chosen to join with us and just want to say a very quick congratulations to our graduated high schoolers. Thank you so much. And man, give them a round of applause. We're going to celebrate them a little bit more at the end of the service this morning. Why don't you stand with us? We have so much to celebrate, so much to be thankful for. Pri um, mainly the love that came down to save us from our sins. So let's celebrate this morning and sing about that love that came down. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Whoa. Listen, once again, it is so wonderful to see all of you here this morning, and I know we have some guests as well, and I'm sure you're here to, to see family, and um, we're just so glad that you're here, and um, we're thankful that we get an opportunity this morning to come and to join together in lifting up His praises. That's what we're called to do, and this morning, I hope that there's anything going on right now um, that may be distracting you from doing that, that may be causing... Um, Maybe some uneasiness or maybe, um, you know, just, just things going on around in that head of yours. I know how that goes. Um, trust me, if you had seen the morning that I had already, <laughs> whew, sometimes it gets a little crazy. Um, but right here in this very moment, we get to pause, we get to slow down, and we get to reflect on His mercy, His grace, 
and his love for us. So I'm going to pray for us this morning as we continue. And that's my prayer for you is that we would center in and we'd focus on his mercy and his grace this morning. Father, your grace, we're so humbled by it. God, we acknowledge just how great it is we can't even imagine. And Lord, we pray as we sing these next words, and God, later as we study your word, that we would be reminded of your mercy, of your grace, and your love, God. And Lord, we pray as we leave these doors this week, would show that same mercy and grace and love to others so that you experience your love as well. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Our good and dark is new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. be seated. At this time, we're going to ask our ushers to go ahead and begin passing out the elements of communion. And as the song is being played, we ask that you hold on to those. And then at the end, we're going to come out and we'll take communion together.
beautiful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus oh lord my god when Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great. Son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul. Shout of acclamation and lead me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Good morning. 
My name is Bob Civils, and I serve as an elder here at CCF and also uh, serve on the office ministry team, myself and my wife do. This is the portion of our service where we remember, and we all have things we remember. I want to recount one that especially stands out in my life. Sunday morning, November the 10th, 2019 is the date I will always remember. Let me set the people involved. Our daughter, Mandy Ford, and her husband, Jeremy, their oldest son, Drake, who's 17 at the time, and two autistic twin nonverbal boys, Hayden and Pierce Ford, that are 15. Jeremy's parents, who live in Clarksville, Arkansas, Dennis and Shirley Ford, and of course, Dee and myself. The situation is this. Jeremy and Mandy have just purchased a new home for the family, and the two of them, plus Drake, the older child, are moving and unpacking. Now, let me tell you, having two nonverbal 15-year-old twins with autism is not conducive to unpacking and moving. So Jeremy's parents, Dennis and Shirley Ford, are keeping Pierce in Clarksville for two nights, and Dee and I are keeping Hayden at our home. Here's the timeline. 6 a.m., Shirley Ford, Jeremy's mom, calls him in a panic and is hysterical as she tells him, Pierce is not breathing. He's gone. I'm so sorry. I think he's gone. Jeremy tells her to call 911, which she does. Mandy and Jeremy decide that Pierce must have died with, from a seizure. Sometimes people with autism have those early in the morning. 6.13, three minutes later, Jeremy calls us with the horrible news. We're devastated. Jeremy and Mandy and Drake get in the car and start the drive to, from Springdale to Clarksville. Many tears are now being shed over the loss of their son and at our house, our grandchild. Hayden is with us. He doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand he's lost his brother, but he's literally wiping our tears with his fingers. 6.40 a.m., Mandy calls and tells me that the EMT has arrived and spoke to her on the phone and confirmed he's passed. There's no need to hurry. Nothing more can be done. More tears are shed at the tragedy of the situation, and I'm absolutely helpless to try to consult by phone a daughter that's lost a 15-year-old son. 6.45, five minutes later, Jason, Jeremy's brother, who also lives in Clarksville, has arrived at the Ford house first and finds that Pierce is alive, moving around freely. He then observes that Dennis, his 70-year-old father, is dead in his chair, apparently died there during the night. Jason calls Jeremy to tell him of the situation, and Jeremy now in one sentence realizes for the first time that he has not lost a 15-year-old son, but he has lost his aged father, who is a retired preacher. No one to this day is quite sure what caused Shirley to call the wrong name in her hysteria. 702. Mandy calls me back to inform me of the miscommunication. We're both relieved at the news of Pierce, but devastated by the death of Dennis. Everyone is confused, saddened, and relieved all at the same time. This was the most excruciating hour of my life. Trying to cope with losing a grandson and attempting to comfort a daughter by phone with the loss of a son is a pain I would not wish on my worst enemy. My wife and I have yet to get over the feeling of losing a 15-year-old grandson, even just for an hour. I don't have any trouble remembering November 10th, 2019, and it's not fun. But here at CCF, each week, we get to remember what Jesus did for us. Let's remember. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25 out of the Contemporary English Version. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took some bread in his hands. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Eat this and remember me. Take the bread. Then later in verse 25, he says, This is my blood. And with it, God makes his new agreement with you. Drink this. And remember me. Take the cup. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our
Glad you guys are here today. Welcome to our newly minted high school graduates. That's pretty cool. And their families, thank you guys for being here today. Love that you're here. Thank you to you guys who are joining us online. I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. My name is Pat, and I'm honored to be the lead pastor around here. And we're kind of in the middle of a, a series on some of the writings of John. We're doing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, John, by the time he's writing these three letters uh, and the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, it's, it's at the, really at the end of the first century, and he is the last apostle alive. The rest have been, been martyred, they've been killed, and so John is the last one. He's writing these things down. He's writing from probably the city of Ephesus, which is in uh, the largest Roman city in what is now Turkey. It was on the west coast of what's now Turkey, and it was definitely like a west coast city, Ephesus was. It was the L.A of its time. It was, a, it was. It was a center for entertainment. It was a center for the arts and a center for religion. And so the reason that John is writing is because there's been some false teaching. It's, it, again, the third generation Christians about this time, and there's some false teachers, some false teaching that's creeping into the church. And so John is writing to correct some of that doctrine and get people back to the true gospel. Um, amen. And he is also writing uh, to, to light a fire under Christians in his day, because just like today, there were, there were people who were just like, man, I, I, do my, I do my faith on Sunday mornings, and then that's it. Or maybe they're, you know, John Day, they probably had, also had CEOs, Christian, Christmas and Easter only Christians. You know, that's when you come, and that's when you do your faith, and then, and then the rest of the time, you know, you're just kind of doing your own thing. And so, so John is writing to kind of light a fire. Under, under those of us who, who kind of maybe that's where we're at. And then he's also writing to, to make sure that people understand that if they have put their faith in Christ, that they have what we call an assurance of their salvation, that they can know that they have a relationship with God. And that is great news if you think about it, because what John is saying is that we can, we can know. And I, I don't know about you, but there are times, there have been times, and I want to make a blanket statement for everybody, but I know there's been times in my life, as I look back on my life, and I go, man, there's, there's, there's been a whole lot of times where I have, I have said things that Christians shouldn't say, and I've thought things that Christians weren't supposed to think, and I've done things that Christians aren't supposed to do. And what happens when, when, that, when we do that, and we kind of look back, and we go, man, I, just, I keep blowing it, is... We try to reconcile then the, the truth of what we know that scriptures say that, that we have been fully forgiven, fully accepted, we're fully known and fully loved by God, but then we try to reconcile that with the fact that there's a lot of times when there's a whole lot more me in the mix than there is Jesus in the mix. And, and, and then the little voice goes, are, are, am I really saved? Or am I just kind of playing at faith? And the great news is, John says, you can know, we can know. We can know whether or not we have a relationship with Christ. I'm going to jump into that right after I read this scripture for the morning. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we read God's word and then remain standing for prayer. This is 1 John chapter 3. I'll start in verse 11. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love one another. And whoever does not love abides in death. And all who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life abiding in them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence uh, before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and we do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. And all who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he's given us. 
Let's pray. Father, as we go through your word today, I, I pray that you would, you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear what your spirit is teaching us. God, give us hearts that desire to, to take steps toward you in obedience so that we would become more and more like your son, Jesus, and so that we would be not just hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. So John starts with this principle. We've heard the principle before, and it's this. For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. A couple weeks ago I said that that the epistles of John are like a spiral staircase where he just kind of keeps coming back to these topics. And every time he comes back to a topic, we get a kind of a fresh look or a new angle on that idea. And, And so this morning the angle is Cain and Abel. And he says, don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Well, because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, you guys probably know the story of Cain and Abel, right? Uh, Cain and Abel were Adam's and Eve's uh, sons. Cain was the older brother. Abel was the younger brother. Uh, Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And so they came to worship God one day. And it says, the Bible says that Abel brought the very best of his flock to sacrifice to God. And it says Cain just brought some vegetables. And, and then it says that God accepted Abel's sacrifice but rejected Cain's. And this so enraged Cain that Cain attacked and murdered his brother. And, and the word that John uses for murdered is unique to John. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. Only John uses it and he uses it in the book of John, in the epistles of John, and in Revelation. And, and the word means in Greek slaughtered. And so the picture is of somebody who comes up behind another person and just slits their throat. It's at the same time absolutely violent and completely devoid of mercy. And and John says, don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know we pass from death to life because we love one another. Whoever doesn't love abides in death. And all who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know murderers don't have eternal life abiding in them. And in John's mind... Hate and murder are connected. They're similar because they are both devoid of mercy and pity and compassion. And and what he's saying is, is when you hate, you are looking at that other person as a murderer would look at his victim, just dead inside. Now, the great news is this morning, I'm pretty sure, looking out at all you nice people, that nobody in here probably hates anybody else. And I'm, I'm, I'd bet good money that it's unlikely that you're sitting here today and you're a convicted murderer, right? So we're good. We're like, this is one of those passages where like, finally John's saying something that I can check the box on. Except that John's not cry, trying to create a checklist. He's not trying to say, well, as long as you don't murder your brother and choke out your sister, you're good. And the reason we know this is because the word he uses for hate It's a Greek word, missio, and it also means to disfavor or disregard or to love less. And so when you read about hating your brother and sister, it also means if you disregard them or you love them less, if you show favoritism to to these people but not to these people, if you have conflict with somebody and you just shine them on, you don't care. If you say that's a you problem, that's not a me problem. If you say, well, I really love these people. I don't know about these people. And all of us at times probably have fallen into one of those spots. Because again, if John's only talking about murder and hate, if he's even talking about despising and detesting people, we're good. But it's more than that. And he's saying that, it, that in those moments when we disregard people, when those moments when we love them less, in those moments... We're not abiding. Eternal life is not abiding in us because we are not abiding in Christ. Now, let me clarify. John's not saying that you can lose your salvation. Because for John, eternal life is about the abundant life of Christ that starts at salvation and moves on into eternity. And he's saying that when you you put your faith in Christ, you are granted eternal life, but when you aren't abiding in Christ, you're making, you aren't making life choices, you're making death choices because you're not abiding anymore, you're disconnected from the vine. Now then he says, let me show you, let me give you an example of what this kind of love looks like. He says, this is how we know what, what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we 
ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods, and, and that means financial means. If anybody has financial means. And, and again, unfortunately, we're not let off the hook on this one either. Because in John's world, even those of us who have the least amount of financial means in this room would have been considered well off in John's day. So again, John's talking to all of us. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And it's a call back to the same idea of hatred and murder. If you see a brother or sister in need and you have the means and the opportunity to do something about it, and yet you choose not to, you choose to close your heart, you choose to, to not have any pity or compassion or mercy for that person, you, he's saying you're displaying the same kind of lack of mercy that a murderer does or somebody who hates somebody else does. He says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech. He's not saying don't say I love you, but he's saying don't just let, that shouldn't be the only thing. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, let me give you an example of, of what that looks like. Back in the day, when you would want to go to a concert, you would go and you would buy a ticket and they would give you a paper ticket. Some of you are younger here today. You've never seen one of those. You've read about them. Maybe you've seen them in a museum. Okay? But back in the day, they would give us a paper ticket. And you would take that ticket with you to the venue. And you would hand them the ticket and they would tear off a thing and they would hand you back what was called the stub. You know what I'm talking about? Those of you are, yeah, okay. Charlie knows what I'm talking about. He's been to plenty of, tic, plenty of concerts in his life. So you get this stub. Now, if you show up at the venue and you have the ticket, but you don't have the stub attached to the ticket, they're not going to let you in because it was the stub that validated the ticket. So the ticket is like our faith. You're not saved by the stub, but it's the stub that validates the ticket. It's our, it's our good deeds when we are acting on our love that validates our faith. It's our good deeds that show that our faith is genuine. Does that make sense? You follow me? Now, at this point, if you're kind of tracking with what John is saying, and he's not letting any of us off the hook, you know, I don't know about you, I kind of start squirming when I read these messages, these, these words, because even though I've never hated anybody, I don't think, I know I haven't murdered anybody for sure, okay, take that one to the bank, there have been times, there have been times where I've treated people with disregard. There have been times when I've loved people less. There have been times when I've seen a person in need and I've had the means and the opportunity to help them and I've chosen not to. And I know probably for some of you, as you look back over your life, you're like, man, there have been times where I've thought things I shouldn't have thought, looked at things I shouldn't have looked at, said things I shouldn't have said, done things I shouldn't have did. I know that's not correct grammar, but that's okay. And, and then doubt kind of starts to creep in and a little voice in your head says, well, what kind of Christian are you? Because you do those things. And so in the, in the Holy Spirit anticipates us squirming a little bit he anticipates the enemy trying to get us to lose hope. And so, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John writes these next words and he says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. And what this is called is a term called assurance of salvation. This is how you can be sure that you are saved. This is how you know that you're saved. This is how you know you have a relationship with God. And I love this because we can know. Isn't that great? Isn't it great that you can know if you're saved? It, 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 even when doubt creeps in. Even when doubt creeps in. And, and again, you're, you're dealing with the paradox of, you know, I, I know what the Bible says about who I am in Christ. I'm fully forgiven, fully accepted, fully loved, fully known by God. And yet, uh, I, I wonder because I know what I'm like. And the reason we feel that way it's because we've experienced both sides, right? We've experienced these amazing times when we have spiritual victory. We've made choices that were right. We've resisted temptation. We're like, yes. And we also have these times in our life where we have absolutely crashed and burned. And we live most of our life in the middle 
looking at our potential and our often reality. And that is what causes that doubt to creep in. And that's why I love what John says next. He says, if our hearts condemn us. When your heart goes, do you really think you're a Christian? What kind of Christian are you? If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Let's see if I can explain what that means. So the Apostle Paul writes in Romans, there's nobody righteous, not even one, no one who seeks after God. So, so any movement toward God that we have is all because of God. If we move toward God, it's not us, it's, it's God in us, moving us toward him. And, and there's this concept, and I'll, I'll kind of distill it because it's kind of a high level concept, but it, it's called first level, or, or first order, second order, third order desires. And let me put it in context of faith. A first order desire is when you say, Matt, I'll tell you what, I woke up this morning, Sunday morning, I said, I want to go to church today. I, I can't wait. Let's get there. Get dressed, ready to go. I'm at church early. Woo! Or maybe you wake up tomorrow morning, you're like, first thing I want to do, out of bed, I want to read my Bible. I want to pray today. I want to love people like Jesus loved. I want to live like Jesus lived. That's a first order desire. And, and all that is the Holy Spirit working in you. Now, maybe you're going, well, that's not quite me. I don't know that I always want that. I wish I did. Well, that's called a second order desire. A second order desire is when you wish you wanted to go to church this morning. Or when you wish you got up in the morning, you wish you wanted to read your Bible, or you wish you wanted to pray, or, or you wish you wanted to love like Jesus loved and live like Jesus lived. But even that, even that is the work of the Spirit in your life, because again, you're moving towards God. And you go, well, you know, that's not quite me yet, still, but, but I wish it was, I wish that's where I was. Well, that's called the third order desire. That's when you wish, you wish you wanted <laughs> to go to church, or to, or to read your Bible, or to pray, or to live like Jesus lived and love like Jesus did. But even if you wish, you wish you wanted to, that's the spirit at work in you. And what John is saying, is that even in those times, when those are the times really when your heart starts going, what kind of Christian are you? John says, God knows our heart because it's God that did the work of salvation in you. When you put your faith in Christ, scripture says that he remade you. He, you were reborn, you were remade, you are a new creation. And he puts the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit begins to change your desires. And as you move toward God, even a first, second, or take the win for a third order, or order desire, you're moving towards God, and that's the work of the Spirit. So when your heart condemns you, John says, tell it, shut up, because God knows the truth, because the work of salvation is the work of God in you. And he says, dear friends, if, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God, and we receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and we do what pleases him. Now, this does not mean that God is kind of a vending machine where you can just pray and get what you want. What he's saying is, is that as we abide in Christ, as we, as we love like he loved, as we care about the things that Jesus cares about in this world, then we tend to pray for the things that he would want us to pray about. You know, God's not going to answer out of left field, you know, audacious, self-serving prayers. But as we abide in him, he changes us so that even our prayers are things that God would want us to pray. And he says, and this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Believe and love, faith and action, the ticket and the stub. And all who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. And we all know the words to the song, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And I can tell you, for me, I love that song. But there are days when I wake up and I feel less amazing and more like the blind wretch. And maybe that's you too. And, and I read this week a quote by an author. I couldn't remember. I went looking because I have a couple books I'm reading right now. 
But the author said, and he's probably my age, he said, by this time in life, I thought I'd be further along. And I can tell you, after walking with Christ for 45 years, by this time in my spiritual walk, I thought I'd be further along. Because there are, there are things that sometimes I fall into the same old, I feel like I'm 15 again going, what the heck, man? I don't know if you feel that, that way as well. But when that happens, we have to go back to the promise that John gave us in chapter two. If anyone doesn't, if everyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. And he is Jesus Christ, the one who's truly righteous, and he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. So when you put, when I put my faith in Christ, when I did, 1979, July 11th, put my faith in Christ, I was permanently and irrevocably changed by the work of the blood of Christ in my life. And your salvation and my salvation is all a work of God. For by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. Not of works. It's not from yourselves so that we would boast. It's all a work of God. That means, that means you can never be good enough to get it because it's all a work of God. But it also means you can never be so bad that you could lose it. And I'll tell you, if it, I mean, I'm just going to be shoot straight with you. I don't believe you can lose salvation because I believe salvation is a work of God. And I think if you believe you can lose your salvation, I think you've, you've kind of bought into moralism, and moralism is a false gospel. Uh, you know, moralism is when you, you believe that you were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but now after you're saved, you've got to work as hard as you can to be as good as you can. And that is not the gospel. Salvation is a work of God. It's all a work of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And when you get saved, Scripture says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing your salvation. And so even when your heart condemns you, even when you go, I bet I lost it because nobody who does what I do thinks what I think, says what I says, says what I says, says what I say. I went Popeye there for a second. No one who does that gets to keep their salvation. And, and that's where Satan wants you. That's when you go, hey heart, hey stupid little voice. It's all a work of God and God thank you that you know my heart and you know the work that you've done in my heart because it's all your work. And even if I wish that I wish that I wanted to follow God more with my life, that's the work of the Spirit in you. And John says, that's how you know, because the Spirit abides in you. So how do, how, do we, how do we bring this all together? How do we apply this in our life? How do we live this out this week and next week and the week after? First thing, and I've said it a million times, and I'll say it more until we're done in the series, abide. The first thing we need to do is abide. We need to spend time in God's presence. We need to be mindful of the Spirit's presence in our lives and walk with the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and guided by the Spirit. Understand that wherever we go, He goes. And we're mindful of that as we abide in Him. And then out of abiding comes fruit, which is the second thing, that we need to live out of our abiding. We don't try harder. When you abide, fruit is the natural result of abiding. So you don't have to try harder to be better. You, you abide more and naturally flows out of that those good deeds. And you, you engage with the power of the Spirit to make God-honoring choices. And then when you blow it, when you don't, when you're like, I, I really messed up, then John says, go and confess your sins. And when you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive your sins, every one of them, even, this is, even if it's the first time you committed that sin or the 3,427,256 time you've committed that sin, he forgives your sin every time and he cleanses you from all, capital A, capital L, capital L, unrighteousness. And even if your heart accuses you and condemns you, God knows your heart and knows that even if you don't feel like it, he's forgiven you because you've confessed your sins. And he can't not be faithful and he can't not be just. 
So you, 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 when you mess up, you, you confess, and then you get back to abiding and living out of your abiding. And when you sin, when you mess up, when you make a wrong choice, when you think the thing you weren't supposed to think and say the thing you weren't supposed to say and do the thing you weren't supposed to do, you confess it. You get back to abiding. And I hope that encourages you. It's encouraged me this week. I mean, I, I, I never doubted my salvation, but there's times, you know, you're just like, man, I should be better by now. But this has encouraged me that when my heart condemns me to go back to God and say, you know what, God, even though I still got these things that I struggle with, even though I still have these things that trigger me to do stupid things, and sometimes instead of making a healthy choice, I make an unhealthy choice. Sometimes instead of making a choice for life, I choose death, even though all that is true. You forgive me when I confess, and you know my heart, because the work in my heart is your work, not my work. So this week, word of the day. Those of you in the military remember the word of the day. The word of the day is abide. You wake up. God, I want to abide in you today. I want to be mindful of your presence. I want to walk with you. I want to understand that at where I go, you are. There's nowhere I can go that you aren't. So just be mindful of you. And then out of that, live out of that abiding in the power of the Spirit, making choices that are God-honoring. And when you don't, when you stop abiding, when you sin, when you mess up, you just say, God, I messed up again, I know. And I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And he goes, I got you. Again, and don't worry, I'll get you the next time too. I forgive your sins, and I cleanse you from unrighteousness. And even if your stupid heart condemns you, know that I know your heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for your assurance of our salvation. Thank you that the work of our salvation is all you and not us. And I pray that we would live into that truth this week in ever-increasing ways. And when we don't, thank you that your forgiveness is a prayer way. So help us to live like Jesus lived, love like Jesus loved, so we can become more and more like our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Good morning, CCF. My name is Nathan Corder. I'm the student pastor here at CCF. Uh, today's a great day. Today's a wonderful day. We're going to get ready to recognize our seniors. Um, oh, thank you, sir. Um, but before we do that, I want to um, just, we're going to begin with our offering. Um, I'll go ahead and have the ushers come forward. Here at CCF, we believe um, in generosity and living that life. And we are just so incredibly blessed uh, to be a part of a church that is just so gracious and how you guys give. And here in a moment, you guys are going to see some seniors up here. Um, and your giving and your generosity, well, thank you, buddy, um, is directly reflected in their lives. It's such a cool thing to see, to have seniors go out into the world after being, um, spending time in our care and how um, they were loved and treated here in a church. So it's because of you that we get to have a real significant part in our seniors' lives. So thank you again on behalf of our seniors, on behalf of our church, on behalf of our missionaries around the world. Thank you so much for all you do to support us. So if you are a graduate of the 2024 class, I would ask that you please come to the stage, please, at this time. Don't be shy. Give them a round of applause as they walk to the stage. Come on up, guys. Yep, just, yep, just right there. Very good. Very good. Right off the tape. Very good. Okay, so here's how this works. This is one of my favorite things we do here. Um, it's also one of the hardest things I have to do because I get super attached to my students. And as you can see, they're all wonderful, beautiful, wonderful women and men of God, and we're just so incredibly proud of them. So at this time, um, what you're going to see is we're going to go right down the line here, and we are going to recognize all of our seniors. Okay? So at this time, let's recognize Mackenzie Combs. Pictures of her. Can you go ahead and pass that down for her, please? Mackenzie is the daughter of Kevin and Pam Etcher. Mackenzie will be attending John Brown University to study education with a focus on English and a minor in music. You guys, yeah, we'll go ahead and applaud after everyone. Else. Next, we have Hunter Kane. 
Hunter is the son of Brian and Miranda Slar and Stephen and Becky Kane. Hunter will attend Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma to study education with an emphasis in phys ed. Next, we have Tyler Cottrell. Tyler is the son of Josh and Catherine Cottrell. Tyler will attend John Brown University in the fall and study construction management. Next, we have Tiana DeVore. Tiana is the daughter of Jimmy and Marley DeVore. She will attend uh, the University of Arkansas in Conway to study occupational therapy. We have Caroline Dewey. <laughs> Caroline is the daughter of Derek and Kate Dewey. Caroline will be attending the Torenhof. Did I get that right? Torenhof Bible School in Austria this upcoming fall while anticipating, in, while anticipating attending John Brown University in the fall of 2025. Right here, we have Junie Allen. Astrid, well, I'm sorry. Astrid. Astrid, will you be attending school? Okay, she's going to be, she's the daughter of Emily, she does name, Emily and Justin Allen, and she'll be attending the Sight and Sound Theater up in Joplin, Missouri. That's pretty cool. And next, where's Alexis? You're down here. Come down here. Come down here. It's okay. It's all right. You're good. This is Alexis Gillis. She is the daughter of James and Felicia Thompson. Alexis will be continuing cosmetology school at Northeast Tech, where she'll graduate next spring. Next, we have Timmy Hawk. Go ahead and pass that down to Timmy. <laughs> Timothy, I'm sorry. I call him Timmy, but it's, it's Timothy. He is the son of Luke and Melinda Hawk. Timothy will be attending John Brown University to study business and entrepreneurship while continuing to pursue a modeling slash acting career. <laughs> pass that down, please. Next, we have Keaton Helgeson. Keaton is the daughter of Chris and Christy Helgeson. Keaton will be attending the University of Arkansas to, to study accounting while marching in the Razorback Marching Band while playing clarinet. That's it done. Next, we have Sterling Maples. That's my favorite picture. That's my favorite picture. Uh, Sterling is the son of Jeff and Dana Maples. Sterling will be attending YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission Discipleship School in South Africa. Upon returning from that, he will pursue an apprenticeship with Northwest Arkansas Metal Buildings and Odds Electric. And finally, but certainly not least, we have Mary Thurstenson. She is the daughter of Ben and Billy Thurstenson. Mary will be attending Northwest, Ar Northwest Arkansas Community College in Bentonville for nursing while working as a phlebotomist. At this time, if you are a parent um, of one of these students, I would ask that you come to the stage as we pray over them. Um, as our parents are coming to the stage, one of the things that I want to share with you about our senior class is um, I've been here for almost six years now. And so I've had this class the absolute longest. And um, one of the greatest things that this class has ever shared with me was just how to, is how to love and how to persevere. Um, our students have really gone through a lot in their high school careers, uh, through COVID and other challenges academically. Um, this class has persevered and they are ready to be launched into this world. Oh, and one of the things that I am most excited to see them do, excuse me, dear is um, just continue to become more and more of who God has created them to be. And you all as a church has supported them, you have loved them, you have cared for them. Some of you have taught them back in the kids' ministry class and in youth ministry on Wednesday nights. And on behalf of this senior class, I could not be more thankful for each and every single one of you because you guys have changed their lives um, so drastically. So at this time, we're going to pray for our seniors to send them out, and uh, we will close service. Would you bow with me? <laughs> Heavenly Father, today is an incredible day as we commemorate and celebrate our graduating seniors. I thank you for each and every single one of them. We are so thankful to have been a part of their lives and how they impacted ours. Your word says we, that we are each wonderfully and fearfully made and that you know each of us inside and out. It has been the joy of all of us to see these seniors grow, develop, and become the men and women we see now. We thank you for their experiences up until now, and we have been able to help them grow, experience life, and most importantly, develop and begin a deeper relationship with their Savior. 
as we look ahead for this senior class, we think about and pray against the schemes of the evil one that may already maybe started to plan against these seniors. We pray that they have learned to rely on your strength instead of their own to combat these schemes. When they face trials and the storms of life, that they remember you are always with them and you will never leave their side. We ask that you help them remember that we as a church are here and we're all rooting for them, continuing to support them, encourage them, and challenge them to continue to grow in their faith. Let them not become stagnant in their faith, that they, not, that they know more now than ever that they are able to press into you. We are so proud of them, and now it is time for us to start sending them out into the world to make a difference. We pray for the people that they're going to meet and have the opportunity to share you with them. Use them to extend your love and care into the world we live in. Help them be bold, courageous, and loving to these people. Let them bring your light into whatever part of the world they go, they go to. We are excited for them to see where they go, who they become outside of our care. Continue to bless them in all circumstances and help them remember to give you all honor and glory for every aspect of their lives. It's in the most precious name we know. Amen. Give it a hand for this 2024 class of... You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. As they're being seated, I want to let you guys know... Uh, that we have a reception out in the lobby for our families and for our students. You are free to grab some lemonade, some cake, and some cupcakes. Oh, hey, buddy. Good to see you. Okay. And um, we um, would just love for you to stick around for a little bit, celebrate our seniors, give them a hug, wish them luck. They'll be around for a little bit over the course of the summer, of course. But today is the day to really just encourage them. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Hey, I remember when uh, our oldest son was born, I worked for Microsoft, and my boss came up, and he said, he said cherish every moment. He goes, my son was born last week, and he's graduating this week. And it doesn't feel like it's that fast, moms and dads, and grandmas and grandpas, and nanas and papas. It's just like that. And uh, thank you for the way that you have poured into your kids' lives. Thank you for allowing us to do the same thing. And, and just know that we will continue to pray for you and for them, uh, that God would just use them in, in great ways, that they would keep their hearts strong for the Lord. Hey, why don't you stand up and uh, let me give us a benediction, pray a blessing over you today. This is from uh, 2 Corinthians 13, and Paul writes, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.